initiate the recording. So you all should have gotten a pop-up box like I just did. So just be mindful of uh, protected health information um, and not sharing any information that you don't want made public. Uh, we are going to be using the chat and really uh, in these meetings, we've come to realize that that is the most efficient way to do this. There is a link on the screen right now for you to get your slides, get the slides to the uh, meeting. They're also listed on our, our website if you want to get them later. If you're listening by phone, pressing six star six to unmute or to mute your, yourself. And if you are wanting to raise your hand in the webinar, you can do that by the phone as well, by pressing star nine. Most people are online. So the way to raise your hand is to use that button at the bottom of the screen. You can click the live transcript icon if you wanna get closed captioning. And we have listed a link for the um, meeting information on the case management redesign webpage. And you might wanna check it out sometime if you haven't, there's a whole bunch of really great information there. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, again, I mentioned about recording the meeting. Please be cognizant of any information that you share here. Um, and thank you very much for that. Next slide, please, slide four. Okay. So, um, the purpose of the meeting obviously is for us to gain feedback from you, from members and from stakeholders. We will have a specified amount of time during the meeting at, at many points during the meeting for questions, comments, ideas after each rule topic, like we've done before. Nicolette or someone will be reading through a piece of the draft rule. The most efficient way to comment is to use the chat. No doubt about it. We have a large meeting. Be sure you identify the section of the regulation that you're referring to, whether you're using the chat or making a, a verbal comment through unmuting yourself, and we'll do the speaker's cue. So nothing will be lost. We will have things entered into the log. Um, next slide, please. Okay, housekeeping slide number three. Um, you may well, I, I just said that you may provide comments verbally. Um, so to give a, a comment verbally, you can raise your hand on the icon, which is using the hand icon down at the bottom of the screen. I will take names for the queue, then I will proceed through the queue. So when I get, get your name, that's not the point for you to start speaking. That's for me to know that you do want to. And I'm lining up other people so that we can manage our time, budget our time, and hear from as many people as possible. So you can check the listening log afterward to make sure that your comment was successfully captured. And if not, you can contact us. Next slide, please. So we are doing the two minute rule because we have such a large meeting and have had such large meetings and we're learning as we go here in this meeting series. So in an attempt to create time for as many stakeholders to comment as possible, we are taking the two minute time limit and saying if there's any back and forth between you and staff responding to you, then I will be keeping track of those two minutes. You may take a minute for the initial and there may be something you say uh, afterward. And when it gets to two minutes, when it gets to one minute 45, I will give you a hard reminder and a hard stop at two minutes. And the other thing that we are implementing now is uh, we are saying to stakeholders, you raise your hand to get in the queue or give me your name. It is one question or comment each time you are called on in the queue. We've had people do follow-up questions and while I understand that and it's important for us to hear from you, it really does uh, slow us up where other people, where we sometimes run out of time to hear from other people. So it's raise your hand, one question or comment. And we're not doing follow-up questions. You need to raise your hand again, and then you'll go back into the queue. So thank you for cooperating with that. It's a little bit of a new twist, and it's meant to hear from as many people as we can. Next slide, please. Okay, so the agenda, as in the past, we're starting at nine, hopefully by 9.15, we will get through with the introductions and housekeeping. 
9.15 or so, we'll begin with the world review and right around 10.45 uh, or a bit later, if we have more time, we will do our wrap up. So thank you for that, everybody. And Steve, if I missed anything, feel free to jump in, but let's move to the next slide. Okay. Um, thank Steve, you, John. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Oh, Nicolette, welcome back. I'm back. Sorry for that. My computer had to reboot after this um, holiday time. weekend. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Nicolette Cordova. Uh, I'm the case management redesign um, community liaison, and I'm going to try to get through these slides pretty quickly so that we can get to the meat and potatoes, and that is of the rules. Um, we have quite a bit to go through today. So if there's ever a time that you wanted to see what the full presentation um, is, we have all of the recordings as well um, on the case management redesign website. And um, for this one, we will just try to get through these quick. So the purpose of the meeting is that we are sharing the draft rules for case management redesign and the restructure of other roles with the members, family members, and other stakeholders um, to gain feedback. We're wanting to do that just specifically on these rules, not on the policies regarding them at this time. Next slide, please. So the rule process is our subject matter experts draft the rule structure. Um, the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing brings the draft rules to the stakeholders for review, which is what we've been doing here. Um, our subject matter experts in HECPUF and leadership incorporate the approved updates. And then we, the team, sends the rule drafts for approval um, to program integ integrity, leadership, budget, and legal through our e clearance process. And then we have final rule drafts to send to. Uh, MSB, the Medical Service Board. Next slide, please. So for our rule process, this rule review, it's huge. So we are going to meet with our Medical Service Board twice so that we can kind of give them the overlay um, of everything that we've done, all of the rules we've gone through before we do our actual final drafts that would go to the medical service board. Um, and then we present to them to answer and we'll answer any questions, um, get the approval, and we hope for these rules to be in effect by January of 2024. Next slide, please. Our rule timeline is that we've been doing the stakeholder engagement since October. We should be finishing in June, which is very, very soon. That's this month. We'll see um, how we how we do. Uh, the rule, re re rule, rule revisions, the final drafts um, will be completed in September. Um, the initial preparation meeting with MSB will also be in September. Our public comment review will be in October and our MSB hearing will be in November. And we hope again for that final rule adoption, January of 2024. Next slide, please. For anybody that is new to this meeting, um, this is basically what our role structure looks like right now. It is just a very fragmented structure. Um, as most of you know, it's kind of hard to uh, find the roles that you need um, as they are kind of scattered throughout, um, not just in one place. It's a little confusing. So our thought was that we would reorganize. Next slide, please. So here's the way that we have our new structure laid out that we have been going through. Um, we have already gotten through uh, with stakeholder engagement, the member rights, our waivers, our case management agency requirements, our community center board requirements, provider, and now we are to our services. Next slide, please. So the goal for the rule updates is to minimize the duplication within the rule, make sure that requirements um, are consistent across all programs, help everyone involved to understand their roles and responsibilities, and a rule structure that is easy to follow and understand. Um, that is not just for our case management agencies, but we wanted to make sure that it was also plain language and all of those other good things too for our members. Next slide, please. 
and rule structure versus changes that you'll see. We're just moving rules around to be in a more accessible format, cleaning up the language that is outdated or doesn't reflect our current practices and the changes with new statute and requirements in place for case management redesign, um, we had to make some changes to align with that. Next slide, please. For roles and responsibilities, you're gonna be seeing um, Tiffany Damakos was not able to be here today. So it will be myself and John Berry who are helping us facilitators. Um, the HICPUF subject matter experts are going to be here addressing any questions, concerns, comments as they relate to the rule updates um, as I read them. And then the HCBS strategies, they're here to help with that record keeping, the listening logs, our issues for further discussion, um, and posting anything that you see on the website um, if there's any kind of changes or you're wondering whatever happened with that question, if we had to take it back, we post everything there. Um, and they help with assisting with the management and follow-up management and all that good stuff. They've been doing a ton of work um, to help us. Next slide, please. So this is that Colorado listening log. We are up to 457 lines and counting. And so that is always posted live for everybody to see what questions have been asked and um, what the responses have been. Next slide, please. And for our issues for further discussion, this is if there are things that kind of are outside of what I'm reading within the rules, um, you have other kinds of policy questions. Uh, this is where then we will record those that are issues for further discussion that um, the department can take back and look at, not subject matter experts look at, or maybe we direct you in there could already be stakeholder engagement around that subject, and we can direct you to uh, where that meeting would be taking place. Next slide, please. So for updates, um, these are the chat is copyable for everybody, and the HICPUF staff is working to update the logs. We hope to have that done mid-July, and the case management rule follow-up uh, meeting is going to be June 1st, um, posted on the website and on our stakeholder engagement website as well. Because um, we did not get through everything the last meeting since we were having some technical difficulties. Next slide, please. And then I am going to let Karen take it away uh, to explain what you're going to be seeing for our roles today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Stewart. I'm an HCBS benefits supervisor with the department. Um, for today's review, I just wanted to highlight a few things so you have a better understanding of some of the basic changes we've made throughout the documents. Um, everywhere you see, or historically where you've seen client or participant, we've changed that to member where appropriate for consistency. Any capitalization changes um, have been um, that have been made to clean up previous rule updates. We've we've cleaned that up. We've also changed references to individual uh, from individual to member where appropriate. Uh, all references to either CCB Community Center Board or single entry point SEPs have been changed to CMA or Case Management Agency. Uh, service plan has been changed to either person-centered support plan or support plan where appropriate. Um, for assessment, we've tried to make sure that's LOC or level of care screening uh, for consistency. And then for the structure of the rule content, you'll see as we go through these, we've reorganized so that you see the name of the service listed. And we've added definitions as needed followed by details of the service. Hopefully that will help make things a lot more organized, easier to find information, and um, hopefully you'll be excited about what you see today. Nicolette, back over to you, thanks. Thank you, all right. So um, 76 pages, oh my, um, don't worry. Many of these pages are 
black. So I'm going to let you know as I'm reading through kind of we're going to do you're going to see me doing a lot of skipping. The reason why is because tons of it is still in the black, which means there's been no changes. So we're just going to skip through to the next so we can get through these rules. Um, you'll see a lot of red line cross throughs. Um, some of that could be just because the acupuncture and chiropractic service deletions are due to separating out services and aligning provider regulations. What you're going to hear me reading is, as I usually do, anything in blue or in between the brackets. Um, those are some major changes that have happened and anything in the braces or in green. Um, the only green that I'm going to read are going to be those paragraphs. Um, you're going to see that a lot of those changes that she already had talked about, like there's just little language changes that are scattered out in green. And so there's no reason to go through full pages just to um, mark those out because we've already done that here in the slides. So we are going to go ahead and then hop to that and I will get started on reading through the rules. Um, I will pause after certain sets of rules and allow you all to ask questions about what I've just read for the subject matter experts to answer for you. All right, let me get you in the share. Can everybody see that? Do you need me to blow it up a bit? Yes, please. Okay, let's blow this up here. And then I will get to reading. One second, just getting all of my stuff set up. I was kicked off earlier and I had everything where I wanted it and now of course. Okay. So here we go. And again, you'll see that I am going to be doing a little bit of skipping around. So the first couple of pages is just a lot of that redlining that I spoke about. And little language changes. We're going to start here on page three. Okay where we have a little bit of changes under adaptive therapeutic recreational equipment and fees for CES. And that is under C for the adaptive therapeutic recreational equipment and fees exclusions and limitations. The following items are specifically excluded and not eligible for reimbursement. Um, one entrance to fees for zoos, A, B, museums, C, butterfly pavilion, D, movie theater, concerts, and E, professional and minor league sporting event. And then two, outdoor play structures, and three, um, batteries for recreational items, and then the outdoor play structures and things that were already there. use all the scrolling look away if it bothers you because that can be quite a bit. I think actually we skip all the way to page 20. So sorry, I should have just done the skip. Let's do that. Okay. All right, here, that is again, just a little bit of those language changes for the, in the green, nothing really there. Um, in here under A, we have benefits planning is available in the supported living service waiver and the developmental disability waiver.
And then for bereavement and counseling exclusions and limitations, um, we've added in the early and periodic screening diagnosis and treatment. And then here's just a lot of those language changes and redlining again. Um, let's see, here we have, let's see what it's under, talking about CDAS. Under H, um, extraordinary care means a service which exceeds the range of care a family member would ordinarily perform in a household on behalf of a person without a disability or chronic illness of the same age, and which is necessary to assure the health and welfare of the members and avoid institutionalization. Now, I know we haven't gone through very much, but before we, um, oh, here, let's actually finish a little bit more of this CDOS eligibility. Um, there's some in green. So um, under number two, there's been some uh, minor changes of, uh, let's see, to be eligible for CDOS delivery options, the member shall meet the following eligibility criteria. And under two, there's no be enrolled in a Medicaid program approved to offer CDOS. CDOS is offered in elderly, blind, and disabled waivers, brain injury waiver, community mental health supports waiver and complementary and integrative health <clears throat> waiver and supporting li supported living service waiver. And under A, under member training, this is just um, to begin or resume following an episode of closure, the case manager will review the allocation. I can't for the life of me remember why we blue lined it. And I know that I um, had asked before and I can't remember now. Steve, do you remember why the blue line? I believe because it was something new that still is being stricken. Yeah. Sorry. It was uh, just because it was pointing out that there was language that was, a, that was being removed that it actually was a change in removing the language. That's right. Thank you so much. Okay, so here was language that we are actually removing, and that is why it's in blue and blue lined. Okay, so um, begin or resume CDOS. Following an episode of closure, the case manager will review the allocation and attendant management for the member's previous service utilization and consult with the department to will determine whether Full retraining is required or an abbreviated training based on history of managing allocation and services is needed. So that is a change that has now been stricken. Okay, and then I'm gonna pause there before we move to see if anybody has any questions before I move on. Okay, thanks, Nicolette. This is John Barry and folks, as we've done in the past, I'm calling for names for the queue. And you can raise your hand in the webinar by clicking the reactions tab. It'll pop open. You'll see where you can raise your hand. I note that there are, I was just looking, there are a couple of people on the phone only. So, and people have mainly been using the uh, raising hands or typing your comments in the chat. Now, correct me, Nicoletta, if I'm wrong, we're, we are noting all comments and questions that are in the chat. We may or may not be addressing them real time in the, in the meeting at that moment but they are there. So let's start with Jen. Jen, thank you very much. You have two minutes. Jen Oaks. Thank you, John. Okay. I apologize. I don't have a specific question on the rule, but I know you went over um, recreational therapies. And I just wanted to know who I can talk to because I do therapeutic writing, respect writing, and wanted to see if I could get that reimbursed. Sorry, I think that last part got cut out um, before I heard reimbursed. It was cut out for me. 
I do therapeutic horseback riding. Okay. Is there, are there any subject matter experts that are able to answer her question or get her to the right person? Well, Nicolette, this is John. Since it's on the recording, we will not lose it and we will circle back. Oh, that, perhaps. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, one more time. This is John. I'm calling for names for the queue. Um, this is great. People are typing in the chat. Thank you. Several comments and questions. Anyone who would like to speak or give a comment or question verbally right now? Looking for raised hands. And if you are on the phone only, there's a couple of people you can press star six on mute and give me your name as well. Okay, we have uh, Betty. Thank you. Please go ahead. You have two minutes. Hi. When you refer to benefits planning, I think it might be helpful to qualify it as employment related benefits planning because there's dozens of different kinds of benefits planning. So it's an assumption, uh, potentially. I realize it's in the employment section now, but I'm just making that as a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Betty. Anyone else? Hands for the queue. Hands for the queue. Okay, I believe we're at the end of the queue for now, Nicolette. Okay, let's see. I believe the next ones now are not until page, there might be a little bit on 30. Let's see what we have on 30. Nope, I'm just telling myself that it was all stricken. So I'm going to move us to 34. Okay, under the CDOS attendance. Yep, nothing really there. Still just language, the language changes. So, let's just keep moving through. Sorry again for the scrolling. Here we go. Okay, we have Allocations that include health maintenance activities cannot be authorized by the case manager without department approval. The case manager will follow department's utilization management review process and receive authorization prior to authorizing a start date for attendant services. And I'm looking at my cheat sheets too to see how far we're going to be scrolling. We still have quite a bit to go. Um, a lot of just language changes again through here, one word to the next that we're using instead. Okay, here we have quite a bit of in the green updates under. Electronic monitoring and support definition. Under D, medication reminders are medication reminders are devices, controls, or appliances that remind or signal the participant to take action related to medications, including items necessary for the proper functioning of devices, controls, or appliances. Under F, personal emergency response system, PERS, provides ongoing remote monitoring through a device designated to signal, train, signal trained alarm monitoring personnel in an emergency situation. And then remote supports mean the provision of support by staff at a HIPAA compliant monitoring based who engage with a member through live two-way communication to provide prompts and respond to the member's health, safety, and other needs. 
identified through a person-centered support plan to increase their independence in their home and community when not engaged in other HCBS services. And then we've just added in those and supports to electronic monitoring um, and supports inclusions. And under number two, remote supports include the following general provisions. Uh, remote supports may only be approved for personal care or homemaker tasks that the member can perform through coaching, prompts, supervision, and consultations. And also under electronic mon monitoring and supports exclusions and limitations, under D, electronic monitor and remote support shall not allow video cameras in bathrooms, security or alarm systems solely intended to protect the home or property, visual or audio recordings. Should immobile devices be used for two-way communication, the device must be located in a common area, otherwise members will have the ability to move two-way communication devices freely throughout their residence. much more than through that, except for in the remote supports provider shall maintain daily service provisions, documentation, including electronic verification of visits, requirements related to personal care and homemaker tasks. Okay, does anybody have any questions um, over the electronic devices or any of that section that we just went over? So folks, this is John. If you do, please raise your hand in the webinar. We have one so far. Anyone else? And for those who are on the phone only, you can press star six and give me your name right now. Okay, Julie Riskin, please go ahead. You have two minutes, thanks. Um, good morning. I, I just put a lot of it in the chat. It seems like the language is way overly complicated and doesn't always make sense. Like you can't move a immobile device. I told, I'm very happy that you're doing the, you can't be in the bathroom and the person has to have control of it. So I, I love what you're trying to do. And then some of the, if you can scroll up, some of those definitions just seemed like overly complex and wordy. Um, keep going. Yeah, right there. Uh, no, keep going up, sorry. It was around the, yeah, there. Um, the medication reminders um, to take, I mean, I think you could stop it after medication. Um, I mean, I that just, again, seems confusing. And the PERS systems are not always sent to train um, for alarm monitoring personnel, sometimes they, they're set up to directly call people uh, like friends and family. And, um, and then my question with remote supports is, does that mean you can't have a remote support provided from the home of a provider to another client if that's what they all want? Because a home isn't going to be HIPAA compliant, whatever that means. Thank you for your questions, Julie. Do we have um, a subject matter expert that is able to address those questions? Hi, this is Karen Stewart with the department. Um, Julie, thank you for that feedback. We have um, tried to uh, pull a bunch of information. So we'll take your feedback, um, go back and see if we can simplify some of these, make sure we're not having uh, too much redundant information or, or words in there so that uh, we can make sure those are clear. So I appreciate the feedback. Thank you, Julie. This is John again. So one more time, anyone else for the uh, queue before we move forward? I have one hand raised. Anyone else? Okay, I think we'll take one more and then perhaps we'll move forward. Judy Shepard, thank you. You have two minutes. Thank you, John, I'll be quick. Um, in several 
areas of this document. I think a couple other people noticed in the chat as well, but HIPAA is H-I-P-A-A. -A. Yes, thank you. We will get that fixed. Thank you, Julie. So I think we can move forward, Nicolette. All right, sounds good. So we will move on to 51. There should be some more for us to read through. Okay. So for chirp habilitation inclusions, Trip habilitation is a 24 hour service that includes those that assist a member in acquiring, retaining, and improving the self help, socialization, and adaptive skills necessary to reside successfully in home and community based settings. Service components include the following. And those are not all changed. B, cognitive services, which include assistance with additional concepts and materials to enhance communication. Cognitive services are intended to help the member better understand cause and effect and the connection between behaviors and consequences. Services may include training in repetitive direction, staying on task, levels of receptive language capabilities, and retention of information. And then health maintenance inclusions. As part of customer directed attendant support services <clears throat> within the HCBS brain injury and HCBS, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm so bad with these acronyms as well. Child, the complementary integrated health, um, CHCBS, CMHS, which one is that? Um, child, uh, mental community health, mental health community mental health support thanks I see C in front and I always think children um HCBS elderly blind disabled and the HCBS SLS um, supported living service waivers as part of in-home support services with the HCBS children's home and community based service children's um sorry HCBS, what is the first one? Complementary integrated health? Correct. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> Thanks. And HCBS, um, elderly blind disabled waivers. Services may include skin care when the skin is broken or a chronic skin condition is active and could, and could potentially cause infection and the member is unable to apply creams, lotions, sprays, or medications independently due to illness, injury, or disability. Skin care may include wound care, dressing changes, application of prescription medication, and foot care for people with, dis with diabetes and directed by a licensed medical professional. Two. Hair care includes shampooing, conditioning, drying, and combing, when performed in conjunction with health maintenance level, bathing, dressing, or skin care. Hair care may be performed when a member is unable to complete the task independently. Application of prescribed shampoo conditioner, which has been dispensed by a pharmacy or the member has open wounds or neck stomas. Nail care in the presence of medical conditions that may involve peripheral circulatory problems or loss of sensation includes soaking, filing, and trimming. Four, mouth care performed when health maintenance level skin care is required in conjunction with the task or A, there is injury or disease of the face, mouth, head, or neck. B, the presence of communicable disease, C, when the member is unable to participate in the task, D, oral suctioning is required, E, there is decreased oral sensitivity or hypersensitivity, F, 
member is at risk for choking and aspiration. Five, shaving performed when health maintenance level skin care is required in conjunction with the shaving or a member has a medical condition involving peripheral circulatory problem. B, the member has medical conditioning involving loss of sensation. C, the member has an illness or takes medications that are associated with high risk for bleeding. D, member has broken skin at near shaving sites or chronic active skin condition. Six, dressing. <clears throat> dressing performed when health maintenance level skin care transfers are required in conjunction with the dressing. Or then we are taking out the member is unable to assist or direct care. B, assistance with application of prescribed anti-embolic or pressure stockings is required. C, assistance with the application of prescribed orthopedic device such as splints, braces, or artificial limbs is required. Seven, feeding is considered a health maintenance task when the member requires health maintenance level skilled care or dressing in conjunction with the task or A, Oral suctioning is needed as standby on a standby or intermittent basis. B, the member is on a prescribed modified texture diet. C, the member has psychosocial or neurogenic chewing or swallowing problems. Physiosocial, sorry. Um, D, syringe feeding or feeding using adaptive utensils is required. E, Oral feeding when the member is unable to communicate verbally, non-verbally, or through other means. Eight, exercise, including passive range of motion exercise, must be specific to the member's documented medical condition and require hands-on assistance to complete. A, for CDOS, home exercise plan must be prescribed by a licensed medical professional occupational therapist or physical therapist. And then we've gone through quite a bit there. We can pause and take questions before we move on to um, the rest of them. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, John again. If anyone has a comment or question and you want to communicate it verbally, please raise your hand. We have two so far, anyone else? Three people? Okay, I'll be monitoring other hands raised, but Betty, please go ahead. Thank you. You have two minutes. On shaving, I think that you should include IDD. As an example, I have to shave my son. He can't do it himself. He's afraid to. It's not that he physically couldn't do it. He's fearful of it and uh, he's cut himself and so he won't do it. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Betty, very much. Christy, you're up next. Thank you, you have two minutes. Great, thanks. Um, I actually have a comment about a section we skipped over. Um, so 8.7415.03 on day habilitation provider agency requirements. Um, it doesn't appear that the department has identified the source of the language for these rules because this is not how the rule currently appears. Um, and so I'm wondering why there wasn't any sort of notation about where some of the language came from, because it, it appears to be kind of a hodgepodge of a couple of different existing rules and perhaps some additional language. And I'm just, I'm a little lost on that. Do you know what page that was on? It might be easier for me to skip to it. And are there any, is there anybody to be able to answer? Page 43, it looks like. Okay. And you're talking about everything that we have in black? That just yes. So the concern is that the department hasn't indicate hasn't shown that there are modifications that have been made to this language 
And so the language in black, my assumption is that's meant to indicate same language as it was, because it says it was formally at 8.500. Um, not all of this language is from those sections. Okay, we will go, um, we'll go through that section mm -hmm. and take a look and try to um, see where you may be saying or where identify where those then came from to make sure that we haven't added in any extra language or anything new because this should be all just probably my assumption is taken from other sections to put it in this one to make it easier to read um however we will go through and try to identify then where those came from and just do a double check thank you I yes, would also thank Sorry, this is Meg Yanaba. I'm um, the subject matter, matter expert on this service. Um, we did pull this information from all of the different waivers that offer day habilitation. So we'll go back through those and make sure that everything is conducive with the way that the rule is being put forward. Well, and part of the concern is, is without it being identified as being um, some language changes, we just sort of skipped over it. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy. So this is John. It looks like we have no more hands raised, but let me check. Julie Riskin, you had your hand raised. Did you lower it? I did. Thank okay. you. Okay, very good. Um, any other hands raised? Any other names for the queue at this point before we move forward? Again, for those of you who are on the phone, you can unmute your phone, star six. Give me your name. Okay. Looks like no more for right now, Nicolette. All right, we will continue. Number nine, transferring a member when they are not able to perform transfers independently due to illness, injury, or disability, or A, the member lacks the strength and stability to stand, maintain balance, or bear weight reliably. B, the member has not been deemed independent with ad adaptive equipment or assistive devices by a licensed medical professional. C, the use of mechanical lift is needed. 10, bell care performed with health maintenance levels, uh, level skin care or Transfers are required in conjunction with the bell care or A, the member is unable to assist or direct care has been removed. B, administration of bell program, including but not limited to digital stimulation, enemas or suppositories. C, care of a colostomy or a lostomy that includes emptying and changing the ostomy bag and application of prescribed skin care products at the site of the ostomy. 11, bladder care performed when health maintenance level skin care or transfers are required in conjunction with bladder care or the member is unable to assist or direct care has been removed. B, care of external indwelling and <clears throat> suprapubic catheters. C, changing from leg, from a leg to a bed bag and cleaning of tubing and bags, as well as perineal care. D, medical management as directed by a licensed medical professional to routinely monitor and document health conditions, including but not limited to blood pressures, <clears throat> pulses, respiratory rate, blood sugars, oxygen saturations, intravenous or intramuscular injections. E, respiratory care, postural drainage, Two, cupping. Three, adjusted oxygen flow within established parameters. Four, suctioning mouth and or nose. Five, nebulizers. Six, ventilators and tracheostomy care. Where am I? Seven, assisted with setup, assistance with setup and use of respiratory equipment. Twelve, bathing assistance is considered a health maintenance task when the member requires health maintenance level skin care transfers or dressing in conjunction with bathing. 13, medication assistance, which may include 
set up handling, administrate, handling and administering medication. A, for in-home support service only, the IHSS agency's licensed healthcare professional must validate attendant skills for medication administration and ensure the completion of tasks does not require clinical judgment or assessment skills. 14, accompanying including going, accompanying includes going with the member as necessary according to the care plan to medical appointments and errands such as banking and household or shopping. Accompanying the member may also include providing one or more health maintenance tasks as needed during the trip. Attendant may assist with communication, documentation, verbal prompting, and or hands-on assistance when the task cannot be completed without the support of the attendant. 15, mobility assistance is considered a health maintenance task when the health maintenance level <clears throat> transfers are required in conjunction with the mobility assistance or the member is unable to assist or direct care has been removed. B, when hands-on assistance is required for safe ambulation and the member is unable to maintain balance or to bear weight reliably due to illness, injury, or disability, and or C, the member has not been deemed independent with adaptive equipment or assistive, assistive devices ordered by a licensed medical professional. D, positioning includes moving the member from the starting position to a new position while maintaining proper body alignment, support to a member's extremities and avoiding skin breakdown may be performed when the health maintenance level skin care is required in conjunction with positioning or the member is unable to assist or direct care has been removed. The member is unable to complete tasks independently. E, health maintenance activity task can be approved at the discretion of the department if not all rule criteria are met, but the member is still present. If the member still presents a need for skilled care for the specific task, we will pause there for questions. Nicolette. Okay, this is John again, and we have two hands raised so far. Anyone else who would like to make a verbal comment? You can raise your hand in the webinar. Okay, let's start with Julie. Thanks, Julie. You have two minutes. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, CCDC and I'm sure many other disability organizations are very strongly opposed to removing the ability to assist or direct care from skilled. There is no provider that will do this if someone can't help at all um, using personal care. So that's, and I think that's that's a violation of you know what we've told CMS and everything else. It requires judgment if someone cannot assist or direct, and that's that's kind of the cornerstone of what's considered skilled. So as long as we have these false distinctions, um, we we have very strong feelings about that, and that's something that we would. Um, you know, go as far as we need to, and we, we would not support the rule if this is in it. Okay, thank you, Julie. We'll move on. Uh, Michelle Morris, thanks. You have two minutes. Thank you. I'm actually just going to kind of echo what Julia is saying, that the removal of the member is unable to assist or direct care um, leaves a huge gap in services. Um, even though some of these things, you know, under, I guess, um, HICBUF definition would be personal care, A, there's not a pediatric personal care provider be in the Children's Disability Advisory Council. We've discussed many times allowing personal care to be a part of um, children served under IHSS and even CDAS. And so right now, I mean, if you look at there needs to be age appropriate definition. I understand and agree with that. But if you have an 11 to 14 year old who still needs full assistance with bowel care, bathing, dressing, and things like that because they're unable to assist or direct care due to an IDD or other purpose, um, these are going to get denied and we're going to have a gap in service because there is no pediatric personal care and personal care is not being allowed for children. 
Okay. Um, which of our subject matter experts would like to address the comment? Hi, this is Danielle Comstock. I can respond um, to the removal of inability to assist to direct care. Uh, before we before I respond to that, I do want to just add this section E here where it says health maintenance activity tasks can be approved at the discretion of the department if not all real criteria are met, but the member still presents the need for skilled care or uh, the specific task, that should actually be its own sub bullet that covers all of health maintenance activities. That's not only applicable to positioning or mobility. And with that being said, I think that that can attune to um, why the, uh, the task unable to assist or direct care is being removed. Oftentimes that specific bullet is being can be used as a catch-all. And while oftentimes um, somebody being unable to assist or direct care does constitute as a skilled task, um, section E that's highlighted here should be able to capture that um, for individuals. So it's it's not restricting, um, it's not restricting skilled services or decreasing what constitutes it's skilled. It's just creating a way so that we can have more flexibility within that without necessarily needing to only say members unable to assist your direct care. Thank you, Danny. And uh, we'll move on to the next. Lori Ropa, thank you. You have two minutes. Thanks, John. Um, let me lower my hand. Uh, actually, uh, Danielle, thank you for the reference to letter E. My concern about that, and I'm going to echo what everybody said prior to me, so I don't need to repeat it, but uh, letter E in general, <clears throat> it says that tasks can be approved at the discretion of the department. We know that things change really quickly, and um, I'm always concerned when there's a, a process that involves departmental approval uh, that that might not happen quickly enough. So I guess... I just want to register that that's a significant concern and would love to have a better understanding of what that turnaround would be in making decisions. Is there anybody okay, that would like to, sorry, address that question or would we like to take it back? Hi, Nicolette. Good morning, everyone. This is Erin Thatcher from the department. Um, I just would like to first thank everyone for their feedback and thoughts and suggestions here. Um, I do realize we do have some numbering and kind of reformatting that needs to happen on this rule, so we will definitely make those adjustments. Um, I, I'd love to hear thoughts, um, and maybe not in this meeting necessarily, but um, ideas from the group on how we could ensure that the um, inability to assist or direct peace can be accurately and um, reliably done in our rule section. I, I think right now we're seeing a lot of issues with that, thus trying to adjust it. Um, but we really appreciate hearing from all of you on this. Um, I, you know, I'd also say um, regarding things that could be up for interpretation, thank you for pointing that out. We definitely wanna know um, if there's something that needs to be clarified more or uh, more specific in, than general. So um, thanks for feedback and we look forward to hearing and working with you on these pieces. Thanks, Aaron. So, Nicolette, we are at the end of the queue for now. So we right. move forward. Oh. Sounds good. We will. Thank you, John. And thank you all for your feedback. Um, we will take that back and see what we can do uh, to get some more participation and responses in there. Okay. Looks like we have a lot of red lining that we can jump to. And under hippotherapy is not available if the if it is available under the Medicaid state plan, early and periodic screening, diagnostic and treatment, um, ES, EPSDT, or from a third party resource. Hippotherapy service provider agency requirements. A, hippotherapy must be recommended or prescribed by a licensed physician or therapist who is enrolled in a Medicaid as a Medicaid provider. B, the recommendations must clearly identify the need for hypotherapy, recommended treatment, and <clears throat> expected outcome. Okay. 
And then under E, we've just added for the eligible member means a member who is enrolled in the following home and community-based service waivers um, and had added supported living service and children's extensive service, extensive support. And under home modification inclusions, um, under number four, modifying a bathroom facility for the purpose of accessibility, health and safety, and independence in activities of daily living. And then under the HCBS, SLS, and CES waivers, supported living service and child extensive service waivers, one, the combined cost of home accessibility adaptations, vehicle modifications, and assistive technologies shall not exceed $10,000 per member participant. Cost two, costs that exceed this cap may be approved by the department or DOH to ensure the health and safety of the member participant or eligible or enable the member to function with greater independence in the home. If one, the adaptation decreases the need for paid assistance in another waiver service on a long-term basis. And two, either A, there is an immediate risk to the member's health or safety, or B, there has been a significant change in the member's need since a previous home accessibility adaptation. And home exclusion and limitations. Finishing, um, so um, home modifications must be direct benefit to the members as defined in um, 10 CCR 2505-10 section 8.493.1. That needs to be updated. So under C, finishing unfinished, <clears throat> unfinished areas in a home to add to or complete Habitable square footage is prohibited. Two, adaptations that add to the total square footage of the home are excluded from this benefit, except when necessary to complete an adaptation to one, improve entrance or egress to a residence, or two, configure a bathroom to accommodate a wheelchair. Three, any request to add square footage to the home must be approved by the department or DOH and shall be prior authorized in accordance with department procedures. D, the purchase of items available through the durable medical equipment, DME, is not a benefit. E, adaptations or improvements to the home that are considered to be ongoing homeowner maintenance and are not related to the member's ability and needs are prohibited. F. Upgrades beyond what is most cost-effective means of meeting the member's identified need, including but not limited to items or, finish, <clears throat> or finishes required by a homeowner's association's HOA, items for caregiver convenience, or any, item, any items and finishes beyond the basic required to meet the need are prohibited. G. The following items are specifically excluded from home accessibility adaptations and shall not be reimbursed. One, roof repair. Two, central air conditioning. Three, air duct cleaning. Four, whole house humidifiers. Five, whole house air purifiers. Six, installation and repair of driveways, sidewalks, unless the most cost-effective means of meeting the identified need. Seven, monthly or ongoing home security monitoring fees, eight home furnish furnishings of any type, <clears throat> and nine HOA fees. And home modification, projects are prohibited in any type of certifi certified or non-certified congregate facilities, including but not limited to assisted living residents, nursing facilities, group homes, post homes, and any settings where accessibility or safety modifications to the location are included in the provider's reimbursement. Are there any questions from that that we had just read? Folks, if you do have a comment or question, you can raise your hand in the webinar. 
and it's the reactions tab <clears throat> on the bottom of the screen, excuse me. For those on the phone only, you can unmute your phone, star six, give me your name. In one hand so far, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Julie, thank you. You have two minutes. Go ahead, please. Yeah, just what I put in the chat of like air related issues are hugely connected to disability for and for people that aren't, you know, don't have the financial means that can mean that I mean, we've seen people go into nursing homes over that issue. Um, but both the purifier and the air conditioning, if there isn't, uh, now it might not be that they need central air, maybe they just need a, a window unit or something, but it, it that seems to be very short sighted. I, I think, again, it needs to be done cautiously and appropriately, not just we're going to do central air for everyone, but the, to totally exclude those things, I think, is not wise. Julie, this is Emily Walsh. I'm the benefit specialist for the Home Mod Benefit. Thank you for that feedback. The right now, whole house humidifiers or air purifiers are not allowed. That does not mean that um, window units or other things like that wouldn't be covered. We can definitely take a look um at the feedback and kind of add it to the list okay, thank you julie and emily anyone else have a comment or question at this point on what was just covered you can raise your hand in the uh, webinar okay jose torres thanks you have two hey. minutes jose thank you john uh, yeah, just to piggyback on what Julie just said, in fact, as a board uh, chairman of the Rocky Mountain Human Services, we often see um, our MHS having to cover that type of modification with meal levy money, which shouldn't be, should be able, be able to be covered, especially if it's something related to the disability of the client should be able to be covered by a home modification or some other type of Medicaid benefit. Thank you, I just, want, I just wanted to add that. Thanks very much, Jose. Anyone else for the queue? Okay, Nicolette, looks like we're at the end of the speaker's queue for now. All right, thank you. There's 64. Sorry, I'm looking at my pages to see if I'm going to have to be scrolling a bunch for you all, but it looks like there's some more um, to read pretty soon here. Um, so here again, it's just a lot of the language changes. So we are going to skip through those. And there's a little bit of an ad here. I'm trying to skip it for home modification reimbursement. Photographs taken before and after the home modifications has been completed. So that would be under um, the submission of claim. Okay. And work that was previously previously completed prior to department approval is not eligible for reimbursement. Homemaker services. Homemaker service definitions. A, homemaker provider agency means a provider agency that is certified by the state fiscal agent to provide homemaker services. B, homemaker means the services provided to an eligible member that include general household activities to maintain a healthy and safe home environment for a member. Homemaker inclusions. A, HCBS elderly blind disabled waiver, brain injury waiver, when the member is receiving personal care services, complementary and integrative health waiver, community mental health support waiver. One, services shall be for the benefit of the member and not for the benefit of other persons living in the home. Services shall be applied only to the permanent living space of the member. Two, homemaker tasks may include routing light house cleaning, <clears throat> routing light house cleaning routine, 
routine light housekeeping, such as dusting, vacuuming, mopping, and cleaning bathroom and kitchen areas. Two, meal preparation. Three, dishwashing. Four, bed making. Five, laundry. Six, shopping. Seven, teaching the skills listed above to members who are capable of learning to do such tasks for themselves. Teaching shall result in a decrease of weekly units required within 90 days. If such a savings in service unit is not realized, teaching shall be deleted from the care plan. B, children's extensive support CES waiver supported living service SLS waiver. One, homemaker services are provided in the member's home and are allowed when the member's disability creates a higher volume of household tasks or requires that household tasks are performed with greater frequency. Two, there are two types of homemaker services, basic and enhanced. One, basic homemaker services include cleaning, <clears throat> completing laundry, completing basic household care or maintenance within the member's primary residence, only in the area where the members frequent, where the member frequent. A, assistance may take the form of hands-on assistance, including actually performing a task for the members or queuing to prompt the member to perform a task. Two, enhanced homemaker services includes basic homemaker services with the addition of either procedures for habilitation or procedures to perform extraordinary cleaning. A, habilitation services shall include direct training and instruction to the member in performing basic household tasks, including cleaning, laundry, and household care, which may include some hands-on assistance by actually performing a task for the member or enhanced prompting and queuing. The provider shall physically present to shall be physically present to provide step-by-step -step verbal or physical instruction throughout the entire task. One, when such support is <clears throat> incidental to the habilitative service being provided, and two, to increase the independence of the member. C, incidental basic homemaker services may be provided in combination with enhanced homemaker services. However, the primary intent must be to provide habilitative services to increase independence of the member. D, extraordinary cleaning are those tasks that are beyond routine sweeping, mopping, laundry, or cleaning, and require additional cleaning or sanitizing due to the member's disability. Do we have any questions before we move on to the exclusions and limitations? So this is John, and if anyone does have a question or comment, you can raise your hand in the webinar. Again, that's the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen for those uh, few folks who are on the phone only. You can unmute your phone, star six, give me your name. Okay, seeing one so far, Betty, thank you. You have two minutes. You know, some of our members have 24 seven line of sight care. And so this cost containment on the homemaker, if, it, if doing homemaker doesn't result in lowering the number of units then they'll lose the benefit. Just isn't realistic. And perhaps I'm reading this wrong, but for those members who have 24 seven line of sight care, you, you know, the teaching, they may get better and better, but they're always gonna have oversight. Um, they need prompts or whatever it might be. So to say you're gonna lose the benefit if the units don't go down is, very frightening. And maybe I'm wrong about this. So maybe you can enlighten me. Thank you. All right, we are seeing if we are able to address that or if we need to take it back. In the meantime, if anyone else has a comment, want to get in the queue, you can raise your hand for the next one. I'm sorry, go ahead, Nicolette. Oh, no, I, I think so. 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. I apologize. I think someone on our team is going to take that. Just one moment. All right, great. This is Emily Harvey. I'm with the Participant Directed Programs Unit here. If we can scroll up to the uh, the teaching portion, I think that we can clarify that a little bit. So it's um, Betty, your comment. Uh, first of all, thank you for that for that comment. Um, it's just a little bit down on page 69, the very top of page 69. Uh, seven. Thank you. So it, it lists out these homemaking tasks and then number seven talks about teaching the skills. So Betty, that's really where we talk about um, decreasing the weekly units. It's strictly related to the teaching aspect, not all homemaking services. Does that help? Well, it does, but the teaching never ends. That's, that's the problem. There's always more skills to learn. The teaching never ends. I mean, my son can do so many un unbelievable tasks, but I'm still teaching him to do more. And so it's, you know, there was a presumption that there's, you know, you teach somebody one skill like laundry or shopping, let's say shopping doesn't mean they can make money They, you know, there's a lot more to these things than just um, a list of six things. You know, it's they're very profound, actually, teaching somebody with an IQ of 40 about these things. It takes years sometimes. And yes, it pays off. The payoff is incredible. But when my son does laundry, I still have to hang out and make sure he doesn't put the wrong thing in or what, you know, it's. Yeah. I just wanted to make that as a comment. Betty, thank you so much. We appreciate that feedback. Uh, it's the insight and input there is really helpful. Um, and there's another comment in the chat, uh, similar to yours as well. So we can definitely take that back and just see um, if things can be just looking at how to make it more um, understandable for folks. Uh, but really just, again, thanks for the feedback and, and we'll take a peek at that. Thank you, Betty and everyone. Uh, Julie, you're up next. You have two minutes, thanks. Julie Riskin. Yep. Julie changed her mind about speaking. Okay. Anyone else for the queue at this point? You can raise your hand on the webinar to get your name in the queue. Okay. Nicolette, I'm seeing none. No more at this point. All right. Let's continue. Homemaker exclusions and limitation. A, elderly, blind, disabled waiver, brain injury waiver, when the member is receiving personal care services, complementary and integrative health waiver, community mental health supports waiver, children's extensive supports waiver, supported living service waiver, Waiver homemaker services may not include, but is not limited to the following. One, personal care services. Two, services that, uh, services the person can perform independently. Three, homemaker services provided by family members per statute. One, CDOS only, a family member or member of the member's household, did I say that right? Family member or member of the member's household may only be paid to furnish extraordinary care as defined in CDOS definition and regulation number, which will be added. Um, homemaker, uh, sorry, for homemaker services provided in uncertified congregate facilities are not a benefit. Five, lawn care, snow removal, removal, routine air duct cleaning, and animal care are specifically excluded and shall not be reimbursed. Six, billing for travel time is prohibited. Seven, services that do not meet the task defined for homemaker may not be approved. And then homemaker provider agency requirements. A, elderly, blind, disabled waiver, complementary and integrative health waiver, 
brain injury waiver when the member is receiving personal care services, community mental health supports waiver. One, all providers shall be certified by the department as a homemaker provider agency. Two, the homemaker provider agency shall assure the document that all shall assure and document that all staff receive, <clears throat> sorry, that all staff receive at least eight hours of training or have passed a skill validation test prior to providing unsupervised homemaker services, training or skilled validation shall include one, tasks including the homemaker inclusion, two, proper food handling and storage techniques, three, basic infection control techniques, including universal precautions, four, informing staff of policies concerning emergency procedures. Three, all homemaker provider agency staff shall be supervised by a person who, at a minimum, has received training or passed the skill skills validation test required of homemakers as specified above. Supervision shall include, but not be limited to, the following activities. One, train staff on agency policies and procedures. Two, arrange and document trainings. Training. Three, oversee scheduling and notify members of schedule changes. Four, conduct supervisory visits to members' homes at least every three months or more, often as needed, sorry, as necessary for problem resolutions. Staff skill validations, observations of the home's condition, and assessments of member satisfaction with services. And four, investigate com uh, investigate complaints and critical incidents. B, supported living service waiver. One, SLS provides providers must comply with requirements found at 8.500.98. Homemaker provider reimbursement requirements. Let's pause before we go through there to see if we have any questions. Thanks, Nicolette. Again, this is John and uh, calling for names for the queue for any comments or questions. We have one so far, two. Anyone else? Okay, please feel free to add your name to the queue. If we have time, we'll get to you. We'll start with Christy. Thanks, Christy. You have two minutes. You bet. So section 8.7425.04bi. Um, the reference to um, section 8.500.98, how is the department pl planning on handling that? Because that's just a reference to provider requirements. Yes, there will still be some of the original um, rule that stays in those sections. Anything that we are taking out and bringing here, we will redline through those and then we will bring over here. But there still may be <clears throat> some of those original sections that stand that haven't changed that we're going to then just kind of reference back. Okay, so I wanna point out <clears throat> that if I'm providing the service in the SLS waiver, I have to reference now 8.7500, 8.7400, 8.484 and 8.500.98 in order to provide this one service. And so I would really like for the department to, to take a look at 8.500.98 and consider whether or not they can take that section on provider requirements and incorporate it into the new section on provider requirements because they're trying to simplify. And so now I have to know five different sets of regulations to provide this one service. We will take that back and make sure that we are getting everything that we can so that we don't have a bunch of back and forth and looking through and, um, but it, it is something that we're going to be doing and uh, HCBS Strategies has been helping us with too, with their uh, rule crosswalk of everything that we have gotten that we may be moving from section to section. Um, so 
we're going to try to make sure that we do that with as much efficiency as possible. But we'll take that one back too. To okay. The and eight eight point five hundred point nine eight it is duplicated a lot in this the work that has been done in eight point seven four hundred. All right. Thank you, Christy. We're at time for this comment, so we'll move forward. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Betty, you're up next. Thanks. You have two minutes. Thank you, John. This is an ignorant question. Does this stuff on Homemaker, all of these rules, is that going to apply to the Family Caregiver Program? That's my question. We have a subject matter expert that can answer that. Nicola, this is Candace Bailey. I'm happy to answer that. Of course. Uh, thank you, Betty. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Candace Bailey. I am the HCBS Division Director uh, within the Office of Community Living. And that's a good question, Betty. We don't have a specific family caregiver program. What we have is within statute, it allows family caregivers to provide services. And so the family caregiver is actually infused in a variety of different services. I hope that helps. Thank you, Candace and Betty. Um, anyone else for the queue? My hands raised in the webinar, seeing none right now. Nicolette? Oh, All right. Betty? Oh, thank you. Um, that actually didn't help. I I, I, okay, I'm, I misspoke and said program, and I realized that the family caregivers offer services. My question is, do they need to arrange and document training, oversee, blah, blah, blah? Do they have to do all of the same things that a homemaker agency um, must do, like all of the training and all of those things? Is that also these rules, do they apply since family caregivers our service providers, are they these rules applicable to them as well? That's helpful. Uh, thank you very much, Betty. Um, for the most part, the answer is yes. Uh, and there is some variance based off of the service and the agency, obviously, but we don't actually distinguish, uh, have different rules, whether or not you are a family member versus, for the most part, there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, whether you're a family member or whether you are not, um, if you are providing a service, we have requirements that we actually have to adhere to per the federal government, actually. And so, you know, as far as documentation, trainings, things like that, um, we do actually uh, require family caregivers to, to adhere to those requirements as well. Okay, thanks all. Um, Nicolette, we have no more names in the queue for right now. All right, so homemaker provider reimbursement requirement. A, elderly blind disabled waiver, brain injury waiver when the member is receiving personal care services, complementary and integrative health waiver, <clears throat> community mental health supports waiver. One, payment for homemaker services shall be the lower of the bill charges to, max to the maximum rate of reimbursement set by the department. Reimbursement shall be per unit of 15 minutes. Payment does not include travel time to or from members' residence. Three, if a visit by a home health aide from a home health agency includes homemaker services, only the home health aid visit shall be billed. Four, if a visit by a personal care provider from a personal care provider's agency includes homemaker services, the homemaker service services shall be billed separately from the personal care services. Five, each visit shall be billed to the Medicaid fiscal agent with the following documentation to be retained at the proper, at the provider agency. One, the nature and extent of service to the provider's signature. And then supported living service waiver, SLS provider must comply with requirements found. And that is going to be a wrap for our rules today. Are there any questions? 
So folks, you can raise your hand in the webinar if you have a question or comment. Uh, for those on the phone again, if you want to make a comment, you can unmute by pressing star six. Anybody? Okay, seeing there's one. Anyone else? Okay, Julie, please go ahead, thanks. Yeah, I just have a question. You know, we've been raising a lot of issues. I think it felt like maybe more today. Um, and is there a way that, and I know that your, the log has, um, you know, kind of rationale notes and status, but there's still a lot of, uh, you know, under review um, and then um, is there a way that, there could be like an email or a notice when things are updated so that we know to then go look and see if we still have a problem or not. Because it, like, I, again, it's not like, like the rest of us all have other things that we're doing. So if, if there's a way for us to be told when there's been significant uh, modifications, that would be helpful. Yes, that's great. We can do that. We can definitely send out an email when we do um, a larger chunk of those updates for sure. And then um, if there is ever anybody that goes on to look at theirs and they want to look at theirs specifically, if you do a control F and just type your name in, you can also look for the questions you have to make sure like it'll go then directly to the questions if we haven't answered them or if we've answered them that you feel like we we didn't give a full um we didn't capture what you were really asking you can always email um tiffany and myself as well directly so that we can try to get those updates as well okay thanks nicole and nicolette excuse me and julie um christy you're up next thank you you have two minutes you bet. Uh, this is sort of along the same lines as Julie's question. Um, it, just in terms of process, want to make sure that that we as a stakeholder group have an opportunity to review what goes to the medical services board before it goes there, because there's some significant changes. Um, it, and in order to have a, a full process that there's got to be a give and take. And so I would hate to see um, the department take the volume of input you've gotten, which I recognize is significant, and not incorporate some of the really important changes that will actually help simplify these rules. I'm very concerned about some of the circular references um, and now um, exponential increases in, in rules that we have to review um, that aren't really contributing to more simplified rules. And, and so having an opportunity to see um, and provide some feedback um, before it, it goes to the MSB um, is gonna be important because typically by the time it makes it to the MSB, it gets approved as is. And I, I just don't want to see our stakeholder group be in that position. Thank you for those comments. We are definitely trying to, we're trying to do this huge, robust way of stakeholder engagement so we can try to capture as much as possible before that um, and not just do the public comment period. Um, however, there is also going to be a public comment period um, with the MSB process. So everything, once we get everything going and then through this process um, and trying to address some of those extra issues that have been brought up through the process, um, we're trying to make sure that we capture that before we go through e-clearance and getting all of the updates. Uh, so definitely, again, like if you're seeing something that is not addressed to what you were actually asking or um, not specific enough, you can text or sorry, you can email Tiffany and I directly with that line so that we can kind of kind of like we did with the um, case management agency and the June 1st meeting. We take those when we're seeing that there's kind of a, a specific amount, like there's so many people that are saying, you know, we're worried about choice. So many people saying we're worried about quality within those roles. 
we're taking all of that feedback and then coming together and then having um, kind of that larger meeting to go over those discussions as well. So we will keep doing that and capturing if we're seeing that there's another um, kind of like some of the things that you've now brought up today with services, um, a few different chunks chunks of subjects that we need to further address, then we're going to try to do that to our the best of our ability. We really appreciate everything that you guys have been doing and bringing forward for us. Um, it's helped our process a ton. It's helped us catch errors. It's helped us with uh, language simplification. And um, we want to keep on being partners with you in this. OK, thank you, Christy. Nicolette. Anyone else before we move to wrap up for the day? Any other comments, questions, names for the queue? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Nicolette. Thank you all so much for coming. And again, for everything that you've been doing, I'm going to give you some time to copy the chat and then um, we will be signing off. Thank you all so much. All right, all we're signing off. Thanks so much. Have a great day.